let's get started. And uh, um, first of all, thank you so much for coming to the last presentation of this KubeCon. I wasn't expecting this many people. You know, I, I've done the last talk in, in conferences before, and they were, you know, it's typically was much less attended. So thank you all for, for coming here, and I appreciate that. Um, so the title of this talk is Cloud Native WebAssembly. So there are two key phrases here. It's Cloud Native and WebAssembly. So uh, when, we, when we think about cloud computing, what do we, you know, I think the key notion really is there's, there's really no cloud. It's just other people's computer running your program, right? You know, so virtualization or isolation is the most important technique in cloud computing. You know, so it started with the virtual machine, the VM where you know, um, it's, they can virtualize the infrastructure and provide each user its own, say, um, you know, a computer, right? And then uh, cloud native revolution comes along and uh, it makes, uh, provide tools and, uh, um, um, and new design patterns to make it easier, you know, based on container technology. So you, know, so you would have uh, Linux containers starting with Docker, Linux containers, and uh, um, you know, so makes it easier for, um, to have to run multi-tenancy applications on a shared infrastructure, so that's cloud native. So what about WebAssembly? So a little history about WebAssembly before we, um, before we really go on. So WebAssembly started out as a sandbox or virtualization technology in the browser. You know, so in the browser, people, you know, we have Java, we can run code in JavaScript. However, it's not satisfactory. You know, people want to run code that faster, you know, native code in C++ or in Rust. So they invented uh, a new runtime inside of the browser that provide a security sandbox. It's called WebAssembly. And so WebAssembly started in the browser. And then it moves to the world of, um, we now call Web3, but uh, back then we call blockchain. You know, that's, uh, so um, um, many of you know the Ethereum blockchain, but after Ethereum blockchain, almost all the leading blockchain projects are using WebAssembly to run smart contracts, which really, when you think about it, it has similar characteristics about um, you know, programs in the browser, which is someone, other, someone else's program have to run on your infrastructure, right? You know, so it's, uh, you have to provide a safe sandbox to run it. And it's also the pro same kind of problem that Cloud Native wants to solve. So uh, then in 2019, you know, there is a famous tweet that started all this, is from Solomon Hikes, it's the founder of Docker, and he tweeted that uh, you know uh, if WebAssembly has existed in 2008, we would not have invented Docker. And uh, you know that's uh, he said WebAssembly is the future of computing, right? You know, so that's um, really jump started. So that's a history. That's by, so by 2019, it's really jump started the idea that WebAssembly might provide um, a lightweight, secure, and very fast isolation technology that uh, that performs su superior to the current generation of Linux containers for cloud native applications. So that's the, um, you know, the, uh, a quick background of you know, how we get here, right? You know, so cloud native WebAssembly is really to look beyond Linux containers to have a new type of containers that are based on WebAssembly. And uh, um, so in, the, in this talk, I hope to provide an overview of you know, um, uh, what this world looks like and uh, is it ready for pr uh, production yet? And what are the toolings and what are the libraries that are available today that developers can get started right um, uh, right now, right? So these are some resources. I'm gonna repeat these slides at the end of the talk, so we're gonna skip it right now. So um, how it started, you know, so uh, let's look at a typical um, um, cloud native uh, application that's, let's say a service mesh that is container based today, right? You know, so it's, uh, you would have your application that's written in a language like Go or Rust or Java or you know, whatever. And then, you know, um, you compile that and you have a runtime and then, it's you, you package that into a container, a Linux container. It's uh, and then have the containers managed by Kubernetes or similar, you know, React KubeCon, so you know, um, you know, everybody knows about that. And then, you know, um, in the Kubernetes world, you have, um, you know, you know, you know, say in a service mesh, you have microservices in a pod that has, each pod has two containers, typically, you know, one is a sidecar, the other is the application container. And there's many, many different technologies that you can use to manage this infrastructure and to provide services to the, uh, to the microservice, right? You know, so this is, uh, you know, uh, what, do we, uh, what do we call container-based architecture. However, there are some pain points here. You know, uh, the first, when when Linux container first came out, it was known for lightweight because compared with the virtual machine, it is lightweight. However, when we evolve into the world of WebAssembly, um, the Linux container or the Docker container now appears to be very heavyweight. You know, so if you have a, 
um, uh, uh, container application, for instance, and you need to drag in a lot of operating system libraries and dependency libraries in it. So it's not uncommon to see a container image that is, uh, let's say, a couple hundred megabytes. You know, if you want to do, um, you know, um, a machine learning or AI inference, you know, things like that, you could get a one gigabyte image or even 10 gigabyte image. You know, that's, uh, you have Python, has PyTorch and everything in it, right? You know, so uh, a lot of times it's, uh, um, you know, um, at least from our point of view, from the web, web assembly point of view, it's very heavyweight. Um, it's uh, make it unsuitable for a lot of scenarios, especially on the edge, you know, on the edge cloud or on edge devices. You know, it's uh, it's it's maybe okay for the for the large cloud data center, but uh, you know, when you go to places like the CDN network, the um, the five G five G MEC stations, you know, and you know things of that nature, they become too heavyweight. And also, it's uh, um, the container based applications when it first came out, it's also known for being fast because the, uh, compared with VM, it's fa it's a lot faster. But from WebAssembly point of view, it's we also consider it slow because especially at startup. You know, uh, in order to start a, a container application, you need to um, load all the libraries, you know, from the operating system and also the application dependencies. So it takes, I would say, you know, um, 100 milliseconds or more. If you look at, you know, Datadog survey about AWS Lambda, which is not exactly a container-based infrastructure, but close, it's a, it's a Firecracker-based uh, micro VM. It said half of the request that takes 800 milliseconds to complete, you know. So it's, uh, it's, it was portrayed as a positive thing, you know, but however, if you think about that, 800 milliseconds is 0.8 seconds for, uh, you, know, for uh, you know, for essentially a serverless call, right? You know, that's, uh, um, you know, that's perhaps the number one problem people have been complaining about, you know, with this type of infrastructure, is that the startup time is slow. And in order to mitigate the, the, the slow startup time, you have to come up with strategies like keep warm, you know, so you would have containers that are running, long running, that's running all the time, and uh, just to keep getting those, serving those requests. However, in that case, the heavy weightness becomes an issue because you, you have to have those containers running concurrently. And uh, uh, if each of them takes 10 gigabytes of space, you know, that's, um, you, know, um, you, you know, you will need a very large, um, you know, um, uh, computing infrastructure in order to support that. So the slow and the heavy are related. Because of the slow, you have, um, especially at startup, you can't scale it up and down in many seconds. So in order to serve those requests, you would have to, um, you know, have other strategies like keep warm. And that, um, you know, makes exactly the problem of being heavyweight, right? You know, so the two problems are related. And the third problem is a, li uh, a little bit controversial is that um, in general, we consider um, uh, containers not that safe because um, you know, initially it need kernel space access and now it's much better, it's can, it's, um, it doesn't need that. However, if you look at one, uh, why AWS Lambda use Firecracker VM instead of say Linux container, it's because they, they consider it's not that safe. You know, there's uh, numerous ways you can break out into the, uh, you can break out of the container. And if you look at other large cloud, you know, uh, like Google Cloud and also Azure and, uh, you know, uh, Tencent Cloud, they all have their own ways to have secure containers. You know, like Google has GVisor, right? You know, it's something that's set, uh, you know, uh, beneath the container to make it more secure, but also make it even slower and also more heavyweight. So the safety is a, is a big issue for uh, container-based applications as well. And uh, the other thing that's, uh, that's very interesting is that uh, uh, containers um, produce a, a repeatable development or deployment environment. However, it's not cross-platform. So you, know, you have a container image built for ARM, you have a container image built for, um, uh, for Intel AMD, you have a container image built for RISC-V. Uh, we now live in a world that is um, that faces heterogeneous hardware. It's not only there's more than two CPU types. It also with the rise of Risk Five, and it's also there's many um, other chips that facilitates the CPU. Right? You know, you have the GPU, you have the TPU, you have all those stuff that needs to work with um, that need to work in tandem. And uh, um, so, say if you have a Linux container that you need to run on a media GPU. You need a special type of container to do that, right? You know, so it's not really um, portable across platforms. So that's another pain point. And uh, so, say, you know, um, I've seen a study that says, um, you know, in a typical service mesh, the setup on the left, you know, uh, the proxy itself consumes pr uh, over 40% of the CPU overhead. You know, so that is a very big, um, you know, um, um, 
overhead that the infrastructure had imposed on the application, right? So, you know, so that's what, I cons uh, what we would consider some of the pain points in today's, you know, um, uh, cloud native infrastructure. So how it's going, you know, why, uh, so that's set up the stage why we need uh, a, a WebAssembly runtime, you know. So WebAssembly runtime essentially solves all the above problems, you know, that's, uh, so let me deliver the good news first and then the bad news later, okay. So good news first, it solves all the problems that I have just mentioned. So it's, uh, if you look at the size, in, um, I, um, you know, we, as I would talk, talk later, you know, we, we made an announcement with Docker on Monday and uh, one of the overwhelming feedbacks we got is that how come the services are so small, you know, instead of, um, you know, a hundred, uh, you know, instead of a hundred megabytes image, now I have two megabytes image. You know, it's, uh, it's, it's literally two orders of magnitude improvements for the same functionality compared with the, um, you know, uh, the Linux container images. And at a startup, the, 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 the contrast is even bigger. It's a, a, it could be a thousand times faster, you know. So instead of 100 milliseconds, you have sub-millisecond startup now. With sub-millisecond startup, you, it enables whole new architecture. You can have um, applications that is not running most of the time and only runs when requests come in, you know. So and uh, and uh, shut down as soon as the request goes away. So you know you can. Um, so it becomes a lot more scalable, you know. So um, um, one of the companies in this space is uh, is for, um, you know um, uh, also within the CNCF umbrella. There's uh, Fermia and there's uh, Wasm Cloud. You know those are the companies that provide cloud services for um, for web assembly based runtimes, and they all have the same setup. You know is that when it's uh, the the container or the runtimes only starts up when the requests come in. You know, there's no need to keep warm and consume resource while there's idle, you know, with their idle, right, you know. So it's a, it's a lot faster startup time and it enables new type of application ap architectures. And it has near native runtime performance, you know, meaning that's, uh, you know, if you have application that compiled into WebAssembly, compared with the same Rust or Go application compiled into native application, you can see the performance are, are basically on par within 5% difference, you know. So there's a, um, you know, we have done a lot of studies and, you know, that's um, other Wasm runtimes have done a lot of studies in that as well. And uh, it's secure by default because it's an application that you write, it's not, it doesn't drag in the operating system and its libraries. So you cannot possibly forget to turn off the, uh, you know, the Apache server and leave the Apache server running or forget to patch the Nginx server or, uh, you know, or have the image containing a MySQL server you, you, you don't know about. It's impossible to have those, you know, so it's a very small attack surface and uh, that makes it secure. And also because the security has been tested in a very hostile environments in the browser and on blockchains. So, you know, it has a very, um, you know, um, a solid security model that's it's called, you know, declarative security or capability capability-based security. So everything is turned off and you have to declare explicitly to turn it back on. So, and uh, you know, so it's secure. It's completely portable across different platforms. In that regard, it's very much like the JVM, right? You know, the, you have Java compiled to JVM and then you can run anywhere. It's the same thing, you know, you can accept there's more languages supported on the front end now. You can have Rust, JavaScript, you can have TinyGo, Swift, Kotlin, you know, there's a lot of languages that support it on the front end. You compile them into WebAssembly and it becomes automatically across that platform. So it doesn't matter you want to run on Intel, you know, um, if, you, if you want to access the Nvidia um, GPU, you just need the WebAssembly extensions. You don't need a special type of container in order just to do that, right? You know, so um, it's cross-platform. It's programming language agnostic, meaning that's, um, um, you know, like I said, there's more, uh, numerous, um, we're going to talk about, uh, we're going to talk more about this. It's not entirely agnostic. It's not any programming language. You know, it has different various degrees of support. But in general, it has the capability to support multiple programming languages on the front end. It's unlike Java for a very long time. It's Java is the only language supported. Then, you know, uh, the other JVM languages come later and they're all fairly similar, right? You know, so you, uh, there's many different, sim uh, you know, different languages that you can, you can have. And it plays well, that's the important point. The last point is also important. It plays well with existing container tools. You know, so people keep asking, you know, why, can't, why don't you use Java? You know, you made the comparison, you know, it's, it's like JVM. Why, why can't you use the JVM? Because, um, you know, if you, if you think about the claim that I made, a lot of those are also the claims Java has made in uh, 20 years ago before it moves 
uh, to be uh, uh, you, you know a, a very complex platform. So you know um, there has been a huge amount of cloud native tools that has developed by the community. You know uh, Kubernetes and uh, um, uh, Docker itself and distributed runtimes. We're going to talk about that in a minute, and uh, it plays well with those tools because it's OCI compliant. It's uh, it can you know WebAssembly WebAssembly applications can be submitted and stored in Docker Hub and then be pulled down by say Container D or you know, Docker itself, or you know, Podman, CRIO, you know, all those tools, and then run as, um, you know, uh, as lightweight applications in those, um, in, uh, in those environments. So those are the you know, um, uh, benefits. You know, that's, um, we, have a, uh, we have a runtime that is very specifically optimized for this, um, for this type of use cases, right? So, of course, there's no free lunch. You know, um, we have said, you know, if uh, anytime you, you hear someone say it's a hundred times smaller, it's a thousand times faster, and then there's no trade-off, you know that's uh, that person is probably a salesperson, right? You know that's uh, you know there's uh, there is trade-off, you know there's um, um, you, you know so it is a web assembly is what we call you know at least what I call our, our opinionated framework, meaning that it needs its own SDKs, it needs its own way to develop software. It's not like Linux containers, which just give you the Linux operating system. You know, everything that runs on Linux kind of runs in the container. You, you, you just know that, right? You know, that's, uh, um, you know, but that is super easy. However, we also think it in encourages the wrong behavior. It encourages people to uh, develop very wasteful, heavyweight applications and then try to run them on resource limited environments, you know, because it runs on my machine. Like I have a very, you know, um, uh, you know, powerful machine. And I need to write, I write application, it runs on Linux, so you know, I, I expect it to run on the edge to run Raspberry Pi, you know, or on you know, the CDN network. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, that would be, um, you know, um, for WebAssembly, however, you know, you have your, uh, we have our own compilers, we have our own SDKs, much like Java has its own compilers, Java has its JDK, right? You know, it's a, it, it's a new programming model and it's the new programming tools that the developers would, uh, um, uh, would learn and then, you know, uh, develop, uh, develop new applications that are very specific that to take advantage of those features, that's uh, the, the speed and the size and all that stuff, right? You know, so there's new things to learn. I think, you know, it's uh, good news and bad news. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, and there are common libraries that need to be ported, right? You know, so that's, that'd be the trade-off, you know, so there's, um, you know, um, um, so it's, it's more burden on the developers. Also, I think it makes developers more, um, you know, um, you know, uh, more useful, you know, to, to, you know that's um, because there, there are more things that need to be done by developers, right? You know, so um, a little bit about um, the WasmH runtime. WasmH runtime is only a WebAssembly runtime, um, you know, um, um, that's in the CNCF, you know, that's where the CNCF sandbox projects. And we started the project in 2019, you know, that's uh, right around the time when Solomon Hikes sent out the tweet, right? You know, so we want to develop a WebAssembly runtime that's very specifically optimized for the cloud native use case. We call it Wasm Edge because we see it's mostly, it's, uh, uh, we call it cloud native, edge native, you know, so it's on the, on the edge network and uh, you know, where, where resources are, uh, are more constrained. So it has a lot of features, we can talk about that in a minute, but you know, just, uh, you know, if you're interested in, um, you know, this is a GitHub repository, you know, just go there, you know, there's uh, over 100 uh, commun uh, contributors from the community. You know, if you um, try it out, you know, see, uh, if you see um, any problems, raise an issue, you know, talk to us, yeah. Um, so, like I just said, you know, um, in all this, Cloud Native Web Assembly started 2019 with a tweet from Docker's founder. Um, and uh, then we were hit by the pandemic. Then, you know, um, then KubeCon started again. You know, that's, uh, so in this KubeCon, you know, I think it's have come all uh, the full circle. You know, that's, uh, um, so Docker itself has launched a preview of WebAssembly tooling. You know, the, uh, the way it works is that, you know, um, um, from, the, from the Docker desktop or Docker CLI, you know, it would, uh, you would ask it to run an uh, image. The image could be um, a, a Linux image. It would go to container D and run C and start a container and run the Linux image. If Docker sees the image is a, is a WebAssembly image from a Docker Hub, 
it would go to container D and bypass the whole round C and invoke wasm edge to, uh, to execute that, um, that, that WebAssembly image and uh, you know, to, to, to start up the application. So you know, we have a demo that's uh, um, you know, in the URL here. That's, uh, um, you know, so with a single command, Docker compose up, you can, um, it's actually three Linux, uh, two Linux containers plus a, a WASM microservice, you know, is that one Linux container contains a MySQL database, and uh, then um, next to the database, you have a WASM edge, quote unquote container, but it's a really a runtime it's application. The application is what we traditionally call the middleware, right? You know, so it's connected to the database through a connection pool, and it's uh, at the other end, it's lessons for HTTP request. And then there's a, um, um, there's an Nginx server that serves a static web page in another container. So if you, um, it, with a single command, a Docker Compose up, you can build and launch all three things, all three, you know, it's a, you know, normally it would be three containers, but now we have two containers and the one, the, the, the key application logic is all in WebAssembly, uh, in the WebAssembly runtime, right? So you can, uh, you can try it, you can see the size different of those. You know, the, the, uh, the two containers that does much less, one is a database, the other one is just a static web server, a hundred times larger than the WebAssembly runtime that's in the middle, you know? So, so you know, that's uh, um, our dream, of course, is that maybe someday, um, you know, uh, a, a full-blown database, you know, like MySQL, would be able to run in WebAssembly as well, you know, so that, um, you know, so that we can get the size, um, so, so that we can get everything that is really slim and nice, right? So, you know, so that comes the full circle. So um, uh, on Tuesday, Solomon Hikes uh, tweeted again to say, you know, all, all, all those years after three, he has left Docker and, you know, the company has changed directions and all that. And, uh, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, the, the vision is, try is finally being realized. So we are very, very happy about that. And uh, so, yeah, that's, uh, um, so, you know, um, if, um, if you're interested in trying all this out, just go, go to docker.com. And uh, it has, uh, um, it's currently featured uh, Docker plus Wasm. You know, that's, uh, uh, you can download uh, a, a technical preview version of the Docker desktop and uh, all the Docker CLI and, uh, um, and try it yourself. You know, just uh, the demo I just uh, I told you about, right? Okay, so in the rest of the talk, you know, so I, I think I've covered uh, most of the big picture stuff and I hope, you know, that's, um, um, it's, uh, um, it helps um, everybody understand, you know, why we need WebAssembly, you know, that's, uh, um, you know, what's the value proposition here, right? So um, in, the, in the rest of the talk, I want to um, uh, go, uh, go, go over some of the, you know, current state of the art, you know, what's the status of the tooling support, what's the status of the library support, you know, how, um, you know, um, uh, is it ready for prime time? Of course, you know, I'm biased, you know, I'd say it's ready for prime time. There's multiple, you know, companies in this space, like uh, ourselves, you know, uh, Wasmage, Second State, and also, um, you know, uh, uh, our, our um, you know, um, uh, friends, you know, like Fermion and Wasm Cloud. Wasm Cloud, by the way, is also a CNCF project. You know, that's, uh, um, you know, so there's, uh, companies has been working in this space for a couple of years now. And uh, so th the first I want to talk about is language support for cloud native was web summit applications. You know, so um, like I said, um, one of the um, um, points of WebAssembly is it's, uh, it's polyglot, meaning that's uh, language agnostic. However, it doesn't have SDKs for all the languages. And currently, this is a survey from CNCF, you know, conducted in October 2020, 22, you know, which is, you know, right before this conference. It asked people, you know, um, their, their programming language for, for um, you know, for people who use WebAssembly or want to use WebAssembly as a container, what their programming language are. And as we can see, Rust is by far the most popular and uh, followed by JavaScript and followed by Go, right? You know, so Rust and JavaScript are both well supported on WebAssembly at this moment. And Go support can really improve, you know, that's um, something that's, um, you know, uh, we are working and, uh, you know, um, uh, several big companies in this space, including, you know, um, I don't know if you can, you know, VMware and Microsoft are, are, are working on that to improve Go support in, uh, in WebAssembly. So, you know, there's a variety of different languages that people want to use, but Rust and JavaScript are the, are the most important ones. So, you know, um, as people say, Go is the language of cloud native, you know, um, and Java is the language for the JVM. Um, you know, um, in, in the WebAssembly circle, we, um, we, we, we think WebAssembly's fate is tied with the adoption of Rust. So the Rust is the language for WebAssembly. Rust compiled to WebAssembly is, uh, is, a, is a golden combination. So um, I'll go through those quickly. So, you know, um, with Rust in Wasm Edge, we support a variety of different libraries, you know. So, um, you know, I would say 
uh, eighty percent of the current you know uh, server side Rust applications would easily just compile to to Wasm you know instead of to native, and then and also we provide um, uh, additional support for AI inference you know. Um, pe when people do AI, they typically use Python, which, um, you know, it's, uh, um, e when you use that in containers, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a very big setup. And then, you know, um, uh, it could be very slow because, you know, there's, um, Python does delegate most of the stuff to native, but for stuff that doesn't de delegate, you know, it's a, it's, a, uh, it's a slow language. So we have Rust APIs um, through, through Wasm. We have Rust APIs to run, say, TensorFlow, PyTorch, OpenVINO. You know, those are all running on the underlying hardware. You know, so if GPU is available, we're going to run on the GPU. So it's, uh, so it's a full, taking advantage of full native performance. And uh, so today, I think if you want to use Rust to do AI inference, compiling to WebAssembly would be the best choice because those are the uh, APIs that only work on WebAssembly through the WebAssembly bridge to those, uh, to those, um, um, to those AI inference frameworks. So then there's JavaScript, right? You know, um, and when I give you this talk, I give you this talk numerous times about JavaScript, and you know, people always are very confused. You know, people thought WebAssembly runs alongside with JavaScript, supplement JavaScript. But now we are talking about JavaScript running inside WebAssembly. We are using WebAssembly as a container, right? You know, so we run JavaScript applications inside WebAssembly. So, you know, um, and one of the big issues, um, you know, because we have announced, uh, um, you know, uh, JavaScript. Um, what, uh, JavaScript support in, uh, in Wasm Edge for, uh, you know, I think a couple months ago. Then people immediately go to NPM and put on uh, uh, um, a JavaScript module and try to run it. And of course, it wouldn't run because it has Node.js API in it, right? You know, Node.js is the API that added to JavaScript. So now we realize if we say we are JavaScript compatible, we must support Node.js, right? I think the, the, the um, you know, the other runtimes on the market are learning the same lesson. Dino is supporting Node.js API now, you're right? You know, so, so you know, um, uh, we have have, um, you know, um, um, we have three people working on that, so we are uh, we are aiming to have the full Node.js API support by the end of this year. So you would have, um, you know, uh, any Node.js applications, you would be able to run inside Wasm Edge and uh, take advantage of the, like I said, the security, the, the, the small footprint, the, the, uh, the high speed and all that. So, you know, that's, uh, uh, that's our roadmap for, for JavaScript support. And then there's, um, a language is one thing, like I just, you know, so it's a little, um, you know, intermingled. So language and the libraries are the two things, you know, Java and JDK, you know, that's the analogy I want to, um, you know, I, I keep making, right? So, you know, so when, uh, when the same survey asked people, what are the um, library features, you know, that's um, access that you want from, um, from your, um, you know, from your cloud native web assembly applications? The number one is I.O., of course, you know, number one and number two are both I.O., right, you know. Um, I would say the number one, number two, number three are I.O.s, right, you know, so it needs to access the network because in the cloud native environment, a lot of things, including the database, the sidecar service, the Kubernetes SDK, they are all available through the network. So you need, uh, we need an efficient way to access the network, you know, in a, in a non-blocking, asynchronous fashion, you know, that's, uh, and then there's, um, you know, um, other features that, um, that people want, you know, there's uh, including, um, you know, uh, threads and the HTTP is network again. And, you know, so there's a bunch of things that people want to build into the WebAssembly runtime so that it can have access to those operating system features. You know, so, so this, this is a survey result. And for us, you know, is that, um, you know, because of our focus on the case of microservices. So one of the first thing that we need is to have a, a very high performance HTTP server so that, uh, you know, so that the microservice, so, you know, it, you would have a proxy here or a sidecar here that listens for the incoming HTTPS request and then it's act as a load balancer to maybe, you know, one or a hundred WebAssembly runtimes that you, you, you spin up depending on your load, right? So each of the WebAssembly runtimes can have its own HTTP listeners that come from the, um, that come from the, 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 the um, network proxy or, or the ingress, right? You know, so in, in Rust, we, we provide really good support for um, the um, uh, networking libraries, like uh, asynchronous library like Tokyo and MIO. MIO means a metal IO. And Hyper is uh, Rust's HTTP library, right? You know, so both client and server were supported. And in JavaScript, we have the Node.js server API. And uh, so um, I know this is probably a hard read and I probably don't have enough time to go through that either, but it's, uh, um, but you can see on the top left, it's a Rust pro, uh, it's a piece of Rust uh, program that uh, opens uh, um, HTTP ports on localhost 8080. 
And when a new request comes in, it spawns a new task, asynchronous task, that invokes the function called echo. And the, um, the, uh, it's part, then on the, on the right side is the echo function. The echo function receives HTTP request and pass out what's in it and then generate a response to go back, right? You know, it's so very simple. You know, to write a web service in Rust, it's, it's, it's actually extraordinarily simple. You know, it's uh, because there are lots of new uh, libraries that you can use. You can write it very elegantly. So, you know, so this whole thing is a web service, right? You know, and, um, um, you know, within the web service, you can make HTTP outbound HTTP requests to uh, other web services in the same network or outside of the network or in the sidecar, you know, to consume other services like key value, database, and, you know, things like that. And in Java, um, in, in Rust, again, we have support for the, uh, for, for the entire HTTP stack. And uh, in JavaScript, uh, you know, the Fetch API is really popular. You know, that's, um, you know, we support that. And uh, some co more code examples to do HTTP requests and consume uh, web services. And then we have database clients, right? You know, so uh, because of the socket connection, you know, you can compile. So those, um, those um, uh, strongly typed MySQL um, libraries into, uh, into WebAssembly and run it there. And so we support key value stores. We, SQL, we support MySQL. Include, um, that includes all the databases that support MySQL, right? You know, so database clients are covered here. And uh, so there's a complete example, which is I just mentioned with a, with a Docker example. So, you know, you can run it with Docker or you can run it with command line. You know, it allows you to build a, a, a microservice that is entirely in Rust and compile into WebAssembly. It has a HTTP listener and have the database uh, client on the other end. So, you know, it talks to the database. It's, uh, you know, it allows you to the current, uh, um, you know, operations, the create, read, update, delete, right? You know, that's, uh, you know, the simple things we all do when we first learn, you know, server-side Java, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's the first example everything, uh, everybody has. Yeah. So um, then again, you know, I talked about AI inference. You know, we have, um, you know, um, the uh, WebAssembly standard has, uh, has something called the WASI NN. It's WASI Neural Network. It's a standard API in WebAssembly that allows it to access all the tensor-based, um, you know, um, uh, frameworks underneath it. So we have integrated the PyTorch, which is uh, now a, a Linux foundation project. And uh, uh, OpenWino is an Intel project and a TensorFlow as well. So, you know, that's, uh, um, so it's, um, let me see if I have an example. Yes, you know, so um, TensorFlow inference is also a couple lines of code. You know, I have four demo here, but I don't have time to do that. You know, it's essentially take an image and turn that image, call a function, turn the image into a, a, a tensor and pass a tensor into, say, TensorFlow or PyTorch and get a tensor back. The tensor is an array, and then, you know, depending on what the model is, you interpret that, the numbers in that array and come out with something, you know. So, so for this one, it's an image classification um, application. You send it the image, it will tell you what it is, you know, so you can uh, landmarks, faces, or plants, animals, you know, whatever, you know, depending on how you train it. So, you know, so there's, uh, there are lots of, um, you, know, um, 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 you know, very useful, very exciting application you can do. So as you can see, this, this, this is the whole application, you know, this is a whole web service that takes the input, uh, uploaded image and classify it. It fits into one screen. You know, I, I don't think a typical Python application for machine learning would, uh, would fit into one screen. You know, that's, uh, but that's, um, um, you know, there's lots of, um, you know, um, um, easy to use APIs that allow developers to do that. Uh, uh, I'll skip over that. And then developer tooling, you know, that's also one of the major issues that's, um, um, you know, um, that come up in the survey, that the people say it's really need this, really need improvement, you know, because WebAssembly, like I said, is opinionated framework. It is, uh, it requires long SDKs. So for developers, um, the, 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 the tooling and the, the need to learn this stuff is huge, you know, so, so you know, that's, um, so there needs to be more materials, more tools, and, you know, things like that. So that reflects in the survey. You know, most people say it is, um, you know, it's, uh, it is an area that's currently lacking. And uh, so that's, um, you know, uh, our collaboration with Docker comes in. So, you know, um, so now Watson Edge um, is, um, I think it's, okay. It should be, it should say Docker Desktop and Docker CLI. You know, so it's, uh, um, um, uh, if you don't go to Docker website, they have full documentation there, you know, so that's, uh, um, you know, I really like Docker Compose because it allows you to, for a single file, it allows you to build the whole thing and then, you know, uh, spin up the containers and now you can spe specify which are Linux containers, which are Wasm containers, right, you know, so they can, um, you know, um, it would know how to handle it properly and, you know, it's, uh, it's um, you know, takes you know, three minutes to start up an entire application with multiple containers. You know, that's, um, um, that's you know, I think it is really powerful. 
And uh, of course, you know, on the other side, there's, uh, um, there's Podman, right? You know, this is also a CNC project run by Red Hat. And uh, it's, uh, it's also a container management tools. And one of our community members, you know, um, um, uh, this company is called Liquid Reply. It's one of the large I, um, IT consulting company in Europe. And uh, um, they provided integration for uh, WasmEdge into um, uh, Podman. You know, that's uh, to allow um, Podman users to use the same, um, you know, CRI interface to start up, you know, um, um, uh, WasmEdge containers. Um, together with with Linux containers, they run side by side again. You know, so that's uh, you know, so that's uh, where we are very glad to have uh, you know um, uh, to have our community members to contribute. You know, this type of important work. Yeah. So then, um, um, those are developer tools. But then at deployment, Kubernetes is fully supported. You know, so Kubernetes because those. In order to support those development tools, we, we support container D, and we also support C run. You know, that's uh, C run is the OCI runtime. That is, uh, uh, the, the change to C run has, has merged upstream so that, you know, uh, you can build a version of C run that, uh, that it would, uh, it, when it sees an uh, image from Docker Hub, it would know whether it's a Linux image, it would start Linux container to run it. Or it's a Wasm image, it would start Wasm, Wasm Edge to run it, right? You know, so um, uh, we, when we integrate it at that level, we can have a, uh, we can finally go to my original slides to say we have a, um, um, you know, uh, service mesh with clusters with many different, you know, applications running inside their own containers and they can, you know, and they can all run side by side in the, in the same Kubernetes containers. And then, um, you know, on Tuesday, I gave a talk at, uh, uh, you know, DapperCon. Dapper is also a CNCF incub incubation project. And it's, uh, it's a framework that is very specifically designed to help uh, people design um, uh, uh, microservices. So it uh, it's has sidecars and, and the microservices, you know, sidecars in containers, the microservices in another container, they communicate together with, uh, with the Dapper SDK. So we wrote that uh, one of uh, members in our community wrote the Dapper SDK into, um, um, uh, adapted that into WebAssembly, so that if you have a WebAssembly-based microservice, you can call Dapper services. So Dapper services including service discovery, service um, service invocation, and then you can have um, you know um, um, you know a KV stores, you know um, um, a secret stores, and, and you know uh, messaging queues and all that stuff. So all those things are now available to WebAssembly based microservices as well through uh, the, the SDK integration with Dapper. And uh, yeah, so um, I think I'm um, you know um, I think my time is up. And, um, um, you know, so here are some resources. And if you want to, um, you know, uh, if you want to learn more or if you want to deploy that, just, um, you know, um, please. And uh, um, come to our GitHub repo and, uh, um, you know, talk to us. Um, yeah, and, uh, and if you have questions, you know, um, come and talk to me and I'll stay here as long as anyone, as the last person who leaves the room. So, you know, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you.